Well, hello, and welcome back to the studio. What a busy week we're having. Uh, 15 webinars as part of our e-commerce world review, uh, ranging from uh, live streaming in China to entering the Japanese market via uh, e-delivery and logistics to our Growth 3000. What a week. But uh, we are now taking a slice, if you like, across all of our activity. And today our focus is upon innovation. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be joined in the studio today uh, by Marcus from Apadme. And uh, we'll hear from Marcus in a second and uh, go through the webinar. But first, a few points of housekeeping. So uh, the first one is uh, we love to get your questions. So do drop us a question in the uh, Q&A and I will try and keep an eye on that and integrate your questions seamlessly uh, as if uh, it was all planned, so do do give us those. But if you're shy or you're watching this in catch up and you're thinking, I just need to get that question asked, then research at retailx.net will get right through to us and we'll either respond to them or integrate them into uh, an update. So uh, that's, that's all there is to it. And you will, of course, get, uh, once the session is over, we have a chance to upload it. Uh, there will be a copy of the recording and the deck available for you. And throughout the session, we've put in URLs. So you can click and follow up on the uh, points we've made and, I don't know, maybe share them with loved ones and colleagues as a form of early Christmas present. Uh, but our own early Christmas present in the studio today is Marcus. Marcus, lovely to see you again. Uh, enjoyed our chats uh, as we were planning this. Uh, but tell everyone who you are and a bit about Apadme before we go any further. Thanks, Ian, and thank you for uh, inviting me along. So, yes, I'm Marcus Hadfield, Chief Strategy Officer at Apadme. For those who haven't heard of Apadme, we are a large mobile technology group based all based in Manchester, just down the road from the BBC, 190 of us. We're 13 years old uh, and we build big, complex mobile solutions for all sorts of people. And, and it's specifically in retail for Argos, for the co-op, Domino's Pizza, um, a large wine retailer and a large Irish grocer. Um, those, those to come soon. Uh, and in a previous life, I've been here four years. I've spent 20 years working in advertising for um, Latterly at McCann. Again, lots of retail clients, Aldi. Costa, home base, Argos again. Uh, I joined a Padme four years ago, so I think this is really where the action is. I think the relationships that people are having with their mobile phones are still underexploited. I think the technology is still underexploited. It's exciting times. So great. And, um, just tell us what a chief strategy officer does, because uh, for those of us in retail, we understand spending money and we understand making money. Uh, where, where does this sit around the board table and what, what does it, it do? In the simplest of terms, it's the voice of the customer around the table. So I work with a number of super talented uh, technologists who can build and create anything, and I can't do any of those things. My job is to understand why we're building the things that we build, what success looks like, why customers will use it, and why it will have a positive impact on the businesses. So really understanding before we've written a line of code, you know, why we're doing this and what does good look like. That's great. What a good answer to a, uh, an awkward question to kick us off. Uh, now, we are talking about innovation today, and I thought we should just be uh, specific. So we're not talking about invention or something that's so new, you know, it's science fiction. Uh, innovation is about making new from what you have available, improvements, maybe two or three steps beyond. So I thought rather than just have my view on it or, you know, look for innovation uh, on our website we did ask uh, our lovely research and editorial team so um you'll have seen most of them on uh, our webinars already and uh, a variety this is the band photo here but we will uh, introduce each of them as they go along so we asked them you know what are the things that you would highlight just from this year that stand out to you as being innovative and also interesting, maybe an indicator of what people should be looking at um, in future. So um, I thought I would kick off 
one of the things that has been um, interesting me, which is the fact we talk a lot about data and how important it is to AI and to be able to trade effectively. And um, yet increasingly, uh, so many bits of the organization are swimming in data. I thought one area I wanted to highlight uh, was, if you like, a development of structured approaches to data, not just in the web domain, but uh, across the whole um, supply and value chains. So um, I've grabbed this uh, from GS1. Um, GS1 is one of the most unfamous, famous companies uh, in the world because they created, owned and manage the namespace, the number space for barcodes. So every time you see a barcode and you scan it without thinking, that is a barcode that the retailer has had issued to them by GS1 and is unique to them in the world uh, and so on. So they're kind of behind the scenes, but um, very important. And over the last few years, they've really been working to develop uh, what we what we see as a barcode um, to cover more and more activities. So you have the um, GTIN, which now covers more things than ever before from uh, you know products and services right through to albums. But they've now also added in location numbers. So um, if you take a retail has got 600 stores, each store will internally have its own number, of course, but now it can have a unique reference that maybe your supply chain partner can say, I am taking this asset, this pallet, to this unique store in three-dimensional space. So this is getting very interesting. We can see some major developments happening along there. How detailed will we get? You know, will there be where the change rooms are, where the toilets are? Are there accessible toilets? Uh, is there a cafe? So there's some really interesting things um, to come there. We have the asset identifiers. We're even now starting to um, get uh, identifiers for documents. The key thing here is the documents that have to be shared. So when the driver turns up at your global location number with a globally identified asset, how do you know that he or she has got an approved driving license, that the tachograph has worked and that they are certified to lift pallets on that forklift truck, etc. So again, accreditation of people and the documents they will need um, and of course, then, where you're dealing with very large consignments, understanding which of the many identical shipping containers something is in. So it's it's fascinating to see um, this cohesion and structure around uh, the, if you like, the basis, the data that will support AI. Um, that's that's fascinating. I think you know we'll see even more from them. So real nice innovation. Um, and available for anybody uh, to access and use. Um, but an interesting thing that builds on top of that then is, you know, when we're looking at uh, quality systems, uh, there is the axiom that says, you know, say what you do, do what you say, and prove it. And um, wh one of the drivers behind more data is to increase supply chain visibility. And this is important, obviously, not just for when will that T-shirt be in stock or, you know, what's the delivery time for this item, given it's coming from, you know, a different place. But also around sustainability and people looking beyond the label to see how it was made, where it was made. Um, you know, if you say it's fair trade, how can I be sure that the uh, workers collective in Guatemala did in fact get 17% of the sales price and they've used it appropriately. So um, I did want to do a call out to a company that's, that's not massively new, it's been going a couple of years, but is introducing um, blockchain into supply chain assurance. Now, Marcus, we were talking about uh, blockchain um, earlier on and saying it's got a bit of a, a bad rep in some quarters because of its association with the speculative aspects uh, of um, cryptocurrencies. But this whole angle of 
being able to use the mechanisms of blockchain to provide assurance to customers is something that's increasingly important. That assurance is vital to know who we trust. Is, is that what you're finding? Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, yeah so blockchain has been obviously around for a while and it, it, it gets sometimes lumped in with hype. And I don't think it is. I think this is a fantastic example of where blockchain's um, authenticity really strikes home. This and the previous slide that you shared, they do the one thing that consumers really want, and that's get closer to perfect information. So, um, and if the consumers can get perfect information, then we get to a place of perfect competition and they can really make the choices and the buying choices that they want with total certainty. And I, and I think that's only a good thing because it, it will drive up good behaviours from brands and organisations, depending on what your definition Absolutely. of good behaviour is. Well, it, it's interesting you say about that perfect information because there are so many approaches to try and simplify what is, you know, a very complex set of interactions and trade-offs. Um, and one of the new uh, approaches is to have um, eco scores on the front of packaging. Uh, and there's quite an interesting group uh, coming together, uh, Her Majesty's Government, uh, Nestle, obviously with their multiple brands, M&S, Co-op, Costa, Sainsbury's, um, looking at a coherent and consistent way uh, to show um, the, the food impact. So um, here's a mock-up of a uh, Finnebrogue uh, bacon um, bacon packet and you can see here you've got the usual marketing stuff the usual free froms um, but at the bottom uh, just on the left is an example of the labeling that uh, is being considered which has an eco impact um, it's a cross between a thermometer and traffic lights uh, which mirrors the nutritional content so we now know what's in our food but we also know the impact our food uh, is making. So that's been quite an exciting, uh, I think, innovation. And I suppose the innovation isn't just having the idea. Innovation is getting enough people together to adopt it so that the idea becomes a reality that's accepted by the, uh, by the consumer. So um, Martin, uh, who is our head of research, uh, when we asked him, he rather picked up on the sustainability point uh, and this case highlighted a company called Cirque, um, immediate pun on uh, circular economy, of course. And uh, what's interesting about this is it's um, very much focused on the raw materials of, um, of the clothes uh, we buy and use. And so when you look at their website, you can see Cirque.Earth, um, they are looking at a couple of key areas. So using recycled cotton to replace virgin cotton of course uh, cellulose um, which uh, something is called rayon which we all know and love uh, from the 50s and 60s is now making a return as a wonder fabric and pta uh, which stands for something i can't uh, even pronounce and uh, is replacing a lot of the um, oils that are used in polyester, uh, nylon, and so on. So very much a, uh, a materials-first innovation. And it's interesting to look at the people who were behind this. You have Patagonia, uh, one of the early pioneers of organic cotton, and then organic cotton with much lower water and pesticide impacts, uh, so reducing that impact. They decided that just being non-harmful wasn't enough. So if you like, the strategic leap they made was saying it's not enough to reduce or minimise our harm. We have to repair the planet. So a very visionary uh, strategy there. So they're now looking at recycling cotton uh, in order to reduce landfill and reduce the uh, impact. Then we have a manufacturing company uh, involved, which is the uh, Marabent. Fashion for Good, which is um, a collective looking at campaigning for um, sustainability within fashion and a private equity house. So I think what's innovative about this is rather than being individual voices 
calling for change. We're seeing all of the main levers and players in the value chain coming together. The, uh, the product, the manufacturing, the industry campaign and the money all meeting uh, to improve what's being offered. So um, that was a nice call there by Martin, uh, you know, and again, playing to the fact that sustainability isn't just some, a label you slap on the end, but is very much baked in. Now, this one is uh, Sy from Left Field, as befits our uh, managing editor, Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan um, is totally focused on um, records. So when he's not doing our top uh, top 500 and top 1,000 reports, um, he's been looking at how uh, retailers that you might have um, seen as part of the last century are very much coming into the current century in a, a strong way, <clears throat> which is around um, Bandcamp Fridays and giving a platform to indie labels and uh, independent musicians to access, not well, not just access the customer, uh, but monetize that access. And I think uh, what we can see here, Marcus, is a, a shift in the value chain for who the intermediates are between the customer and uh, the producer. Whereas before it would be the record label, the radio stations, we've seen that disaggregation, which initially I think disadvantaged the musicians, that's now coming back with new platforms that are transparent and provide that liquidity for them. So very much a, a strategic shift in in who aggregates and delivers value. Yeah, I mean, I, this, this, uh, this is right in my lane. I, I'm a Bandcamp customer. Um, anyway and what i think they've done is that they've, they've done they've done two or three really positive things one they've democratized it and created a fast uh, d2c channel for smaller artists in, in the first instance um actually a number of larger artists also use it as a distribution channel they've uh, created a, a huge amount of, sort of scarcity there's lots of limited edition runs on bandcamp you can only get the stuff on bandcamp um and most fundamentally, they've built a market position where they are known to be giving fair value back to the artists, as you say, much more direct, many fewer intermediaries, uh, not the streaming pittances that other big streaming providers give. Um, and, and I think for music lovers, it's becoming the place to go. Bandcamp Friday is really interesting. This was them going one step further and giving even more back. So back, the way Bandcamp Friday works is that uh, and it was a pandemic driven thing, but I think it will, it will stay for good, is that they recognised that the music industry and artists were in a really difficult spot um, in, in the last year. So every last Friday or every first Friday of the month, I think it's last Friday, uh, they take no commission. So anything that is bought on their platform, all of the money goes straight to the artists and the labels, which is which is excellent. It's really putting your money where your mouth is. and. Mm. I think it's been really good business for them. You know, they've established themselves as the credible place to go and buy music. Yeah. And it's interesting you say credible as well, because, you know, one of the themes that is uh, sort of unspoken, but is is permeating uh, this, is this idea of authenticity and character. So as a retailer or brand, the way we behave is now as important as what what we sell the how is as important as the what so uh, it's interesting seeing that and um it's also interesting that uh, jonathan who often is the more luddite end of the team and always asked why or why should we care uh, he always challenges us on that is that he's selected the uh the sort of amazon go models uh, and how they're moving into physical retail and i can remember the first time i went to an amazon go store in the us it was kind of really you know this is this is a lot of fuss to just grab some things from the equivalent of the lunch chiller at the front of a boots. It just seemed a bit overblown, parked it in my brain, uh, and then bit by bit, it just seems to have, you know, moved along and is becoming real rather than just a one-off. Uh, have you, Marcus, been to any of these 
a largely unattended scan in, scan out, grab and go stores? Yeah, I have, and and I think I I think you're absolutely right. They're one of those innovations that feels a bit awkward and weird at first and unnecessary, but before you know it, just that removal of friction makes it the norm. Yeah. I think things like paying the first time you paid for goods with your phone and your thumbprint, it all felt a bit. Well, this isn't better than using a card, but it is, and you, and you you get there. I think what's really interesting about Amazon um, here is that they're now allowing other retailers to use that technology. Exactly. So walkout can be adopted by much smaller stores, and I think that's where we'll see the real growth. I don't even know whether they've used those stores, the big five London stores, as um as a marketing tool for everyone else to adopt their technology. Or, or as a real play, so it will, that 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 will be interesting. But just exactly. just what is, is here to say. Well, we we did ask and uh, got a resounding no answer when we asked about their um, the profitability of the Amazon five star stores. So, uh, if there is anyone uh, from Amazon who thinks that uh, they would like to let us know, uh, then do drop me a note. Uh, research at RetailX, and we honestly we won't tell anyone. Uh, who told us feel free now um let's have a little look at uh, the next thing and ah oh, this this comes in from marcus so marcus you mentioned you've been doing um work with a co-op we yeah. had a lovely interview with chris conway uh, on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago and you know we were quietly impressed with the sheer volume and breadth of the uh, innovation and partnership activities they were undertaking. So um, tell me what you've singled out here. Right. So um, at the beginning of, of the recording and the show, I said that I felt mobile was being underexploited, and I still do. And I think what's really interesting is it's starting now. Um, what I mean by it starting is that there's a huge shift to digital loyalty. So in the last month, Morrison's relaunched their card as a digital card. Lidl launched a huge success last year, um, the highest um, downloaded shopping app. McDonald's and Burger King are just trialing it in the US. Mm -hmm. So digital loyalty is here. Um, where I think the co-op stand out, and they're, they're very fortunate, the co-op, because they, they're not loyalty, they're membership. And they're a 150-year-old organization, um, a movement rather, and never been more relevant. And the idea that being a member of the co-op, a bit to your point earlier around purpose and, and value, uh, you know, you're, it's a not-for-profit organization where as a member you get to donate your points to the causes that you support. This app is making that front and center now, whereas in the past it was a buried part of the organization. Because it's so easy, to do and so immediate uh, and so personal i think this is what lifts the co-ops loyalty scheme which is really membership scheme into something different they've they've, they've understood that power of the emotional connection as well as the financial reward yes and i think you know one of the new battlegrounds is going to be out of the two three hundred apps on your phone which one either gets home screen presence or frequency of use without you thinking, oh yeah, I've forgotten I had that there. So um, speaking of apps uh, and jumping to food, uh, you also pulled out the Domino's uh, new app. Yeah, um, this this is another one that we've worked on. So this, there's only two I'll mention. Um, uh, and what, what makes Domino's app amazing to me isn't just the fact it's even easier, even quicker, even more robust. To, to order your pizzas it's just those little innovations that they've built on top or we've built on top with them and the first one is the idea of group ordering these pizzas are big they're designed for sharing and they're designed for those moments of people getting together so um the group ordering app that we built with Domino's really pulls on the insight and if we're all meeting tomorrow we can start in advance to to pick our pizzas and get excited about the meeting together the, the, the meeting that we're going to have if I'm a particularly fussy person who doesn't want this, does want that, I can spend as much time as I want picking and changing and amending without without annoying that point person who used to have to be the orderer. So I think it really mm. plays in that shared experience, um, makes it more yes. sensible. It's hard to do. Well, look, I think um, what, what I like about this example is that we are moving from uh, a focus on the payment to a focus on the individual. So. You know, if um, 
I mean, I think you get this generationally because, you know, if, if I take my kids out, then they just assume I pay, they order what they like, it's one payment. As far as the restaurant's concerned, I am the customer. Whereas if you're then a group of teenagers who are arguing over who had the biggest slice and who's going to send the money back and forth, uh, often that's lost if you don't have this sensible app that captures, for example, customer preference, uh, you know, what the distributions are of different people, the combinations, and, and really enabling a direct engagement with the cus customer, not just with that split second of pay, but I think is a, a really smart move and um, something I think we're, we're seeing post-pandemic, um, you know, with at-table ordering, um, and also the payment providers are really stepping up with bill splitting and so on. So I think, you know, this is uh, might be one of the pandemic benefits is having uh, launched us on this. Now, um, there was something else that uh, we talked about earlier on uh, that I'd asked you to cover off. So um, let, let's just have a look at this. What, what are we looking at uh, here, Marcus? This is... Um... I think this is fascinating. So, so as as a technical, mainly technology based business, you know, a lot of our work is about driving people to buy things as quickly as they can. But actually, if we're not careful, that conversion rate optimization and algorithm based machine learning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will strip out the fun of shopping. And people like to shop. It's a leisure pastime for a lot of people. You only need to see how quickly people rush back to the high street when they could through the pandemic to see that. And yeah. Uh, and there's a number of startups that are, are beginning to recognize that. Two I've just pulled out here. Go and, go and check them out, Squadded and Wormhole. And they allow virtual shoppers to have that shared experience of, I'm about to buy this. What do you think with your friend? Or, oh, quick, Ian's in that shop there. Let me see what Ian's about to buy. So not like Amazon's um, recommendation engine, much richer than that. A shared shopping experience where you share your wants, your likes, your comments on your friends' things, and, and you go shopping together, albeit virtually. I think I think it's really interesting. And again, if if we'd had this conversation eighteen months ago, I'd have probably rolled my eyes a bit and thought, oh, here again, this whole co this co that. But watching how after eighteen months, nearly of lockdown now. And people doing everything from you know schooling to yoga lessons online, we're seeing what used to be a youth only phenomenon of, um, you know, I've, I've seen my my daughters trying to organise a holiday with their friends, where they each have their browser open in different houses and they're on Snapchat or you know FaceTime with each other, all the time to say, are you looking at this? Are you trying to do that? So they they they're present in the moment trying to collaborate on getting the right place at the right time. I think, again, the time has come now that we've trained uh, our whole population to be multi-screen, collaborative, co-activity people. Uh, these are all things, interfaces that, um, whether it's for customer service or exploration, this is something I think is really going to take off. So um, uh, I think that's a really good call, Marcus. Thank you for that. Um, Let's jump to Liz. Uh, so Liz is our, what can I say? I think in her bio, uh, she takes shopping most seriously of all of us. And it's been fascinating to see um, that her focus is upon refillable trials. Uh, this is interesting because, again, I think this is an age thing. I can remember in supermarkets where uh, a lot of things were wholesale and then packaged for you then we've had the era of any size you like just grab it we're going back now to this uh, old-fashioned new-fashioned way of um you know wholesale into uh, small amounts and refillable things uh, do you think mark this is going to be the new the new way of buying things this is really interesting. I think I, I look at research here and you think, I think stated behavior versus actual behavior will be an interesting one to follow. Uh, it, this is about the fourth or fifth sustainability example we've had already in, in, in just like in 20 minutes. And so the demand is clearly there, you know, the, the, the mood is clearly there. And one thing we haven't touched on 
yet is the is the Gen Z word, but you know Gen Z is our next generation of of consumers and the next generation of the big spenders. And so all of these behaviours will be driven by them. We know that they're driven by purpose. However, I still think it's a bit clunky at the moment. So I think making this uh, desire into something that's still functionally good is where the, the battleground yeah. is. That's my view. Yes. And I, I think that's a good point because, um, you know, moving so that it's, it's not just something that the committed eco-warrior has to do, yeah. but everybody does without thinking and i'm i'm increasingly thinking uh you know as uh, as i get older is that where customers have to think that itself is enough friction uh to inhibit activity um the only so, the thing add to that though is is you do see it in coffee shops now people turning up with their own coffee cup and that has become quite a norm so i'm optimistic we can get it right Yes, I'm just wondering whether that was a COVID, uh, a COVID enhanced um, one. So, um, jumping to Emma, our executive editor. Uh, Emma has recently uh, edited our um, sector report on beauty and cosmetics. So, uh, she's pulling this out. And again, we were talking about this, where um, the AI meeting uh, augmented reality, meeting image processing, meet, meeting colour fidelity, meeting selling, has kind of gone from being a tech example of what could happen to be something that is um, now available in real life. And uh, we decided to use uh, L'Oreal's picture here rather than the trials that we did <laughs> behind the scenes. But I was stunned stunned at the quality of the virtual makeup so you know the, the challenge i present uh, glasses beard uh, etc the ability that the uh, the interface has to you know put makeup on me and then watch where i move despite providing a very poor target uh, has been exceptional i mean i'm, I'm impressed with the technology and also the integration um, that we've seen with, um, uh, with with selling. I think this has been uh, impressive, driven a lot, I think, by uh, the advances in Instagram, TikTok uh, and other platforms. So uh, as an app man, Marcus, is this something that you're looking at and thinking will be augmented everything in no time at all? Yeah, I think we're, I think we're heading that way. I can remember sitting um, in a previous life waiting for film much more rudimentary than this to render. You're waiting like hours for things to render down. And now, you know, these like, these sort of apps are delivering incredible, incredible stuff in seconds. And we, all know, that we all know that technology only gets faster. Um, yeah. I think only this week, Facebook have gone in with uh, L'Oreal and Modiface or Modifas. Um, yeah, yeah, so... so yeah, I, th I think this is is just going to grow and grow. The audience is getting richer and more technically literate. The technology is getting faster and better. Yeah, it's, it's only going to go one way. Um, one of the things I will do is put the link to this uh, in the information we send out so you can see it in real time and to their app. So um, let's just uh, move on. Um, Back to the co-op. This is their second uh, feature today. Um, Scarlett, our digital editor, has singled out their use of delivery robots. Now, we, when we first saw this, it was, yeah, right, they're just going to get stolen or pitched in the canal. But uh, it's gone. <laughs> it's now, it's a real thing, a million deliveries. Uh, have you seen one of these or had something delivered to you in... Uh, by the robot, Marcus? I've not had one delivered, but I've seen them in Milton Keynes um, zipping around the plaza outside the station there. Um, I think it's, I think this is, this is the stuff that challenges you when you see it. You think, oh my goodness, am I, am I watching the future arrive? Um, and again, yeah. it feels like one of those things that, that was a long way away three or four years ago, and now perhaps not, you know, a million, that's not an insignificant number, a million deliveries. Exactly, um, and, and, there's, and, and with a shift to more city-based living, uh, you know, if you look at yeah. the growth in Manchester where we all are, the growth of the number of people who live in the city, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of people yes. whom this is a great benefit. And the increase in things like low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, you know, a, a resistance to uh, the growth in delivery to the door because of the environmental impact back to the environment. And I think there is an adoption curve where uh, you go through a, a phase where it's just very odd and people stop and take photos. Then you go through the naughty phase uh, where if it can go in a canal, it will go in a canal. And then you get to a point where it's so normal that people can't be bothered to even push one or steal one. They're just part of that invisible background of capability. And, you know, it's not going to be long, I think, until um, this is normal. I, I just want to be able to get a lift on one um, because it'll be more, well, it'll be nicer than going by tube. Um, now, we're, we're sort of in the click and collect uh, delivery world still where um, Chloe, who's uh, editor of internetretailing.net, has um, singled out Dunelm. Now, um, over lockdown, uh, Marcus, did you uh, end up doing any of these uh, newfangled delivery things like the IKEA collect from the car park or the curbside pickup drive through? Uh, we or were you just a uh, deliver to the house man? No, we we had the most um, unfestive Christmas tree shopping experience ever at IKEA, where we <laughs> where we drove to Warrington in the rain to collect our Christmas tree from a car park. So we we did a bit of it. I really like this. I think I think a number of retailers were very quick out of the blocks, and we um, at a pub me we talk a, a lot about what are the things that you can do quickly that will drive fast business impact and then we can worry about making it perfect later and i think this is a great example of that you know they 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 faced a very real problem um and they 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 took a quick response to it you know text message that's not modern technology uh, not very modern technology, and and yet it's fantastic for the consumer so whilst i didn't use this one i like it a lot and i think what they're doing there is um they're creating a new a new behaviour that they probably wouldn't have done without realms of decision making and chin stroking, and now they've got it, they'll just start that's to improve. Good. I think I think that's very well put. And uh, again, if the customer gets used to the behaviour, they get the value using tools they understand. What's not to love? You can always uh, improve that later. Now, um, just before broadcast. Um, Woody, my cat, made an appearance, but luckily decided to leave before uh, before we went live. So, you know, pets uh, and lockdown have, um, you know, really gone together. Uh, and Chloe has uh, also pulled out the um, innovations behind the scenes at Pets at Home, which, you know, it, it wasn't the best adopter of e-commerce, um, in, in the recent past, but has not only stepped up its, what I'd call vanilla e-commerce capability, but also looking behind the scenes at adding in, you know, veterinarian uh, collaborations and access, which again has been very tricky over lockdown and really has, um, has shown in the sales. I mean, going through uh, a billion a year um, is, is no mean feat for, uh, for a UK business. So, Congratulations to them. And just interesting to see that focus on a category and bringing in extra services rather than being a single point, um, you know, one trick. Can I say one trick pony or is that just an analogy uh, too far? I think I probably should move on a bit uh, with that one. Um, now, back in the app and mobile world, Paul, who's our mobile editor, has... Um, picked a company called OO oh, 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 oh. uh, if anyone knows how to pronounce that um, do let me know which is uh, sort of gamifying um, fruit and veg sales now um, is this just a desperate attempt by middle-aged people to appeal to the TikTok generation and gamify fruit or are we on to something here Marcus is this uh, is this a real innovation I, I don't know. It's real. Innovation, not sure. I think they're onto something, though. And this is where I start to feel old, right? But um, the the we talked again earlier about Gen Z earlier or Gen Z, depending on which country you live in. And 
the behaviors that that audience demands are diff and expects are quite different to the, the behaviors that uh, the, the older audiences expect. And gamification is a really big deal in this audience. Um, and actually, you do see it in quite mainstream apps now. You know, uh, I I sometimes load my car up with petrol at Shell, and that app is gamified. I realize they're gaming it. You just want to go. And, and these sorts of gamification techniques. So I don't think this is as gimmicky as we possibly first think at first glance. Mm. Um, and do you think it links back to, uh, you mentioned loyalty, membership, uh, etc. Are these literally uh, just different aspects of the same drive for increased eyeball time and brain time with the customer? I think it's trying to, yeah, try, trying to find strategies to stay front of mind. So for those of you on, on the call or, or on watching this who've read the Hooked book by Nir Ayal, I think it's I think they're trying to do some of that. They're trying to find those triggers to prompt and uh, triggers to prompt to stay front of mind. And if it's done yeah. ethically, which is a whole different hour long debate, um, I'm OK with it. And it just feels like a this seems like a fun way to get people to buy veg. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Great. Well, let's go from veg uh, to fashion, mode operandi, Gucci, uh, Ted Baker. In this case, we are not just gamifying we're in gamifying by uh bringing the activities uh into the game and blending uh that sort of uh you know, physical border between the game part of your brain and, and the thing formerly known as the real world or meat space uh as gibson might uh, might have put it so um we've seen this a lot where uh the games manufacturers, you know, the FIFAs uh, of the world and a lot of the um, role-playing games have taken our real-world money to buy in-game kit, powers, capabilities, etc. But this is quite interesting, uh, the idea of buying things that you then wear in, uh, in digital. So you and I, Marcus, could maybe go to Gucci and have an overlay of a virtual video conferencing uh, Gucci t-shirt, yeah. perhaps. Is, is this where we're going? That, um, you know, this, this, this gap between real world and the imagination of mobile is going to fall apart. And it's just going to be our imagination, our relationships across physical and digital. Oh, I don't know. That's big. Um, hopefully not that far, but I think the, the power of gaming is is again totally untapped. I think um, the, the amount of money spent in gaming doubles the amount of money spent in M commerce, as they call it, in re in retail. So it's 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 it outstrips the film industry. It's huge, the gaming industry, and yeah. brands are getting in there. I noticed it. Is it um, Kenneth Cole, the um, U.S. fashion US brand? brand yeah. They launched a product in an app called High Heels. Uh, they had a trainer designed um, especially for Pride Week in February this year, and they. They put that on a virtual runway in a, in, a, in an app, which is interesting different to this, but it just shows yeah, yeah. the power of these games. And you know, before uh, before one gets sniffy about it, it's worth also remembering the growth in NFTs, uh, you know, the non fungible tokens, transactions, whatever the acronym is. You'll be able to buy and authenticate uh, digital things. Um, so again. You know, it may be that Paul has once again identified something that we'll all say, of course, we, we saw this coming uh, in a year's time. And I should just put a quick plug in that Paul uh, is putting the finishing touches right now uh, to the um, mobile uh, and games um, sector report. So uh, we'll hear more about his uh, thinking then. And uh, just to wrap up, uh, we'll come back to Scarlett. Um, who in a way is bringing us back to a commercial juggernaut uh, connection. So I think this one comes from the uh, department of, well, they were bound to do that, weren't they? Um, where Google is now bringing together the search shopping with video. Um, so this is quite an interesting US-based only, but um, 
making all of YouTube more shoppable. So if you're on YouTube first, as well as having the ads, the sponsorship, the in um, the in video product placement, the in video product link cards, we're now going a step forward uh, and being able to bring the data I talked about earlier on with a visualization we've all spoken about with the mobile interface and processing power and the customer data. Um, so it won't be long until we don't even need to go to Instagram anymore. We can live our lives in uh, in Google and YouTube. Uh, is that a world that um, you're anxiously waiting for, Marcus, or uh, have I made that too narrow? I'm not waiting for it, but I think it's a world that my daughter lives in a lot. I um, mean, she follows YouTubers like I used to follow bands. So I think um, this sort of stuff has been around for a while. Uh, I've seen it in sort of ad pre-rolls five or six years ago, but it feels like it's becoming really real now. Um, mm -hmm. Not just shopping out of, uh, you know, the channels like YouTube and the influencers there, but also this whole idea of video streaming. And when, if I'm being snarky, I say, isn't this just like QVC or something like that? But it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's much richer and much more immediate. And, and so I think this is a very, very natural progression. Um, yes. I think it's where entertainment and advertising will, will clash. And that's, a, that's, that's okay. And it's interesting you mentioned QVC because uh, on Friday, uh, I think it's Friday afternoon, uh, we're doing the China country uh, webinar. And I'm sharing some of our uh, stats on the Chinese market. But um, uh, Li Zhong from DR2 uh, Consultants in China is sharing his report and insights on live streaming where, yes. um, again, my thought is, well, isn't this just QVC, but in an app on every single shop, rather than dragging you to a channel uh, that you look at from your sofa? So um, I would recommend highly, if you're interested, uh, you know, logging on for, uh, for that webinar. But um, I, th I think what we've seen here, Marcus, is uh, that a lot of these things are, quote unquote, as you said, coming real. So they've gone from, we could do it, or from a marketing stunt to being now novel deployments that are commercially important uh, and I think look towards things that may become mainstream within the coming years. Yeah, I, I think we've seen two or three different drivers as, as we're going through it. We've seen a big sustainability drive. We've seen what I think a big Gen Z drive, driven gamification and streaming driven by younger audiences who are doing it anyway and then the technology drive what are the new things that new technologies allow us to do whether it's the autonomous delivery or the blockchain tracking and it feels like those are the three the three things that are all coming together and as a mobile i think you've uh, delighted uh, to see you've just explained what the chief strategy officer does uh, by giving such a wonderful summary so i'm not i'm not going to say anything else i think marcus you've Put your finger on it there as a great summation of uh, the drivers behind the points we've picked out. Now, um, those are just our views uh, from the team directly to you. So um, tell us, what have we missed? What innovations would you call out, whether because you've seen them as a consumer or you've admired them from afar as a competitor or, heaven forbid, uh, you are modestly letting us know of something you've done that we haven't yet recognised. Uh, research at retailx.net will get through to us. I'd be very happy uh, to update our views based on your better ideas for the autumn rerun of this, um, which is a neat segue to saying that uh, in addition to our uh, current e-commerce world review, we will be back in the autumn with our third or fourth outing so let us know what you'd like us to cover what areas you'd like us to research and we'll be more than happy to do that uh, but for now our time is up uh, it disappeared marcus enjoyed the conversation thank you very much for your uh, time and insight and analysis it's been a pleasure talking to you um and that's it really thank you to everyone for joining us uh, for giving us your time i hope it's been thought-provoking and that uh, you can now get back to successful and happy trading. Uh, and from the studio, uh, from me and from Marcus, uh, it's goodbye for now. Thank you.